Shalom. Welcome to Yeshiva Pirkei Shel Shanim. My name is Davon Mays. This is also a channel in league with Nativ. And today I'm going to be talking about was Isaac a foreshadowing of Jesus? So we're going to go ahead and share my screen and we're going to get right into this. So the Christian claim, the Christians claim Isaac was a shadow of what would happen to Jesus. We will examine this claim. So I got a couple of questions and points I'm going to be making. Was Isaac going to be sacrificed concerning sins? No. Was Isaac sacrificed by Abraham? No. Was Isaac resurrected? No. Was Isaac a son of David? No. Did anyone have to believe in Isaac or be damned? No. Did Isaac start a new religion? No. Did Isaac preach and have disciples? No. Does Passover have a connection with forgiveness of sins? No. Was Jesus a ram? No. So how exactly do Christians want Isaac to be the example that would eventually lead to Jesus? There's no connection. The problem is Isaac didn't fit, does not fit the description of what happened to Jesus or why Jesus was executed. So first we see the reason Isaac is even involved in this is because Abraham is being tested or tempted. So Genesis 22 and 1, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, we know that the word test in the Hebrew is nasa. It can mean adventure, assay, prove, tempt, try. So the KJV says that God did tempt Abraham. So if the word tempt is also the word for test, excuse me, this would make James, a writer of the New Testament, either ignorant or a liar. So in James 1.13, it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So the question is, who exactly tempted or tested Abraham if it was not God? And it clearly says God tested or tempted Abraham. So we see already a disconnect from the Tanakh and the New Testament doctrines tested. Hebrews eleven seventeen by faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and who, <clears throat> and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. So again, if Isaac was tested, I'm sorry, if Abraham was tested, who did it? Did he test himself? Because it clearly says God did tempt Abraham. Exodus 15, 25. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. So we see God testing Israel. It said, Exodus 16, 4, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So we see clearly in the Tanakh, God does test people. So what exactly was James talking about when he says God himself does not test anyone? Job 7, 17 through 19. What is man that you should exalt him? that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment. How long will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? So we see clearly that God tests us every morning, every moment of life. Psalm 79, oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just for the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. Clear, clear, clear. Deuteronomy 8 and 2. You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all these way, all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So there's too many examples of God testing or tempting us for James 1.13 to say God does not do such a thing. And if Abraham was tested concerning Isaac, was that a test to get rid of sins? 
Was it a Passover? What was going on there? So who tempted Jesus? Matthew 4 and 1. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So if James says God does not test anyone, who would be the one testing? James 1.13, let no one say he is tempted. I am tempted by God. Let, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So if Jesus was tempted by the devil, whom would be considered evil, what exactly would that mean for the Trinitarian thought process? If James says God cannot be tempted by evil, how does the New Testament say the devil tempted Jesus, who many Christians believe to be God? Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Well, a few problems with this. Jesus was not tempted in all points because he didn't fulfill many points. He was not married, so he could not be tempted with adultery. He was not a priest, so he could not be tempted with doing things in the tabernacle against the Torah. He was not a woman, so he couldn't break laws concerning women. He was not a king, so he could not break laws concerning kings. So to say he was tempted in all points would not even be true. And if he was God, and God cannot be tempted, then who tempted him? And if he is God and he's perfect and cannot make any mistakes, is that even a fair test to compare to us? If you can't make mistakes and I can, is that a fair test? No. So we have a problem between James 1.13 and Hebrews 4.15 all together, including Matthew 4.1. Who exactly tempted Jesus if God didn't do it? And if the devil did it, then why does it say God cannot be tempted by evil? So for the Christians who think Jesus, Jesus is God, none of these points can, you can't reconcile any of this. Where is Isaac taken? To Mount Moriah or Golgotha? Genesis 22 and 2. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So it says, go to the land of Moriah. Why is this significant? Second Chronicles 3 and 1. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So we see a significance dealing with Mount Moriah, not Golgotha. So <clears throat> sheep or goat, or not specific, say, was Jesus a lamb? Genesis 20, 28, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. So in Hebrew, it says, Hase, the lamb. But when you look this up, it says one of a flock, a sheep or a goat. So is Jesus ever referred to as a goat? Why not? Because if you're trying to connect Isaac to Jesus and you see the word lamb, is that specifically speaking about a lamb or is it just, or is it just talking about something from the flock, a sheep or a goat? 3775, Kesip, lamb apparently by transposition for a kebis, a young sheep, lamb, 13 occurrences, Genesis 30 and 32, one among the lambs, cattle among the sheep. So we see sheep and lamb for this word kesip, being specific, talking about lambs or sheep, not say. So why exactly is say only talking about a lamb in Christian doctrine, but it can also refer to a goat? Why is Jesus never called a goat? So the word lamb in Greek, English men's concordance, 
Arin, one occurrence. 704, perhaps the same as Arhin, a lamb, as a male lamb. See Greek Arhin. Luke 10 and 3, go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. 286, Amnos, John 1, 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Excuse me. Well, we know lambs or Passover lambs do not take away sins. That's not their function. That's not the purpose of a lamb on Passover. And this is specifically talking about a lamb and a male lamb at that. But if you're trying to connect it to Isaac, it was just a lamb or a goat, something from the flock. It's not specifically a lamb. Arneon, from the word R, 721, lamb, diminutive from Aren, a lambkin, lamb. So there are specific words in Greek and in Hebrew that specify the word lamb. We're trying to connect it to Isaac. It was not a specific lamb that was referred to. It could have been a lamb or a goat. Just some background information. So goats are lambs for atonement. So the whole concept of Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, which would be some type of atonement. Leviticus 1 and 2, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock. Lambs are not singled out for sacrifices. Goats are used for the Day of Atonement because there's bulls, rams, lambs, sheep. I mean, there's many different birds. There's different types of animals used for sacrifices. Leviticus 16 and 8. Then Aaron shall cast two lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Hence the term scapegoat, not a scape lamb. So why is the Day of Atonement talking about goats and not lambs to take away the sins of Israel. It's very specific here. Why goats? Why two goats? Why scapegoat, not scape lamb? Goats versus lambs in the New Testament. The Christians will say Jesus was a symbolic lamb, John 1, and looking at Jesus, he walked, as he walked and he said, behold, the lamb of God. Matthew 25 and 32, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Even though Isaac is referred, Isaac's situation in the verse is talking about God will provide himself a lamb or a goat. Matthew 25 and 33. He will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. This is specific. Except making the distinction between goats and goats and sheep but in genesis it just says say something from the from the flock not specific a sheep or a goat anyone will do rams or lambs genesis 22 and 13 then abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns so abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son <clears throat> so avil or ale, a ram, mighty man, lentil, oak, post, ram, tree. So it's interesting that Jesus was called a lamb and not a ram, because a ram would be an adult animal, right? An adult animal. This would be an adult lamb or sheep. With the full blown, full uh, blown horns and everything, so it's interesting. Jesus is never referred to as a ram. Pretty interesting, but that's what was actually sacrificed in Genesis twenty-two in the story of Isaac. It was a ram that was offered for a burnt offering, and we know Jesus was not a ram, nor was he burnt. Jesus is described as the Passover lamb, 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. So was the sacrificial lamb for
for Israel to take away their sins? No. Ephesians 5 and 2. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So was Jesus burned to give off an aroma? No, not at all. Exodus 29 and 18, and you shall burn the whole realm on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. It is a sweet, sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Jesus was not an offering made by fire. He couldn't have been a sweet aroma. He was not a ram, and he was not put on an altar. So you see all the problems when you really try to make Jesus a Passover lamb and concerning sacrifices of sins and blood and all these concepts. The blood needs to be from an animal, and the blood needs to be on the altar, and also the blood needs to be put there by a priest a high priest from the sons of Aaron. These are all specific things. So just more background information of what's going on with this so-called Passover lamb. And if we're talking about a Passover lamb, it's to be roasted in the fire. And it was actually eaten. And none of it was to be left over until the morning. So if it was left over until the morning, you discarded it, got rid of it. Was Jesus left over into the morning? He was put in the tomb. And if he was already put in a tomb, why would the women be going to put spices and stuff on him if he was already buried? That wouldn't make any sense. He was in there for three days, supposedly, which the math doesn't add up to that either. But it says Lazarus had began to stink after four days. So Jesus was on his way to already smelling. So what would be the point of putting, you know, spices and stuff on him if the next day he was going to start smelling anyway? And two, the, the, the funeral had already taken place. They had already buried him. So why would they be going to anoint a, a body who had been sitting for three days anyway the whole story doesn't even make sense but anyway what happened at the original passover were sins forgiven what did the passover lamb represent in the tanakh exodus 12 and 23 for the lord will pass through to strike the egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts the lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you any such thing happened in the New Testament? No. Exodus 12, 26, 27. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service? What is this for? That ye shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. Did God smite the Romans and deliver Israel when Jesus was executed? No. Excuse me, why not? Because that was not a Passover concerning Jesus. It was a Passover concerning the Egyptians. This is something to remember. This was not a new holiday Jesus instituted that's recognized by Israel. It's something that, in you know, for lack of a better term, a new cult came around called Christianity and started their own religion and had their own rules. That's the simple explanation because it has nothing to do with the actual exodus, even though they try to do it on the same day. So here's where the details ruin everything the New Testament teaches about this claim. How old was Jesus and how old was the Passover lamb? Exodus 12, 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. Jesus was blemished, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Here again, there's no specific law saying it has to be a lamb <laughs> this is clear luke three twenty three. now jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age way past a male of the first year that the lamb was right from the sheep or from the goats why not a lamb only he doesn't fit the description of isaac's story at all Deuteronomy 4 and 2, you shall not add 
<clears throat> to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So we do not see anything about the forgiveness of sins. Jesus changes the reason for the Passover from the remembrance of the exodus of Egypt to remembering him. Luke 22 and 19, he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Exodus 12, 26 and 27, when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service that you shall see? It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. Was Israel spared from, from the Romans? Did the Romans face any punishment or plagues or die when Jesus was executed? Typo there. So the answer is no. Jesus completely changed his holiday. And the reason he gives is to do this in remembrance of him. So we have a problem. He's created a new doctrine. Deuteronomy 4 and 2 says, don't do that. Isaac was hung from a tree, or was Isaac hung from a tree or bound on an altar? I, Acts 10 and 39, and we are witnesses of, of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Genesis 22, 9 through 10. And they came to the place which God had told of him, told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. So we see Jesus was hung from a tree. Isaac was actually put on an altar. Jesus was killed by his enemies. Isaac was not killed at all. <laughs> you see, the further you dig into this, it just does not work out. Did Isaac complain when his father prepared him to be killed like Jesus did? Mark 14, 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not that I will, but what thou wilt. So Jesus says, I don't want to do this, but if you want me to do it, I'll do it. That's not a free will sacrifice. Genesis 22, 9 through 10. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, stretched out his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. Isaac didn't complain. Isaac just laid there. Jesus complained on a few different occasions. Do not do this. Why have you forsaken me? You know, he's complaining the whole time. But supposedly, this is what he came for, right? So all of us, I don't know if he got scared, cold feet, or whatever you want to call it. But he says, not that I will, but as you will. That's two different wills. That means you can't be God because does God have two wills? We're not even considering what the Holy Spirit thought about all this, right? He's not even in the picture. So that's it's really a duality and not a trinity, according to this verse. Since Jesus complained, he would not be considered a free will offering. Leviticus 22 and 18, speak unto Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel, saying to them, whatsoever be, whatsoever he be of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel that will offer his oblation for all his vows and for all his freewill offerings, which they will offer unto the Lord for a burnt offering, freewill offering. Numbers 15 and 3, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice in performing a vow or in a freewill offering or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savior unto the Lord of the herd and, or of the flock. Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from before me. Let this cup pass from, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. I don't want to do it. But if you want me to do it, I'll do it. That's not free will. That's complaining, meaning if God would have told him, you don't have to do it, Jesus wouldn't have did it, meaning it wouldn't have been of his own free will. And again, two wills in the picture. Not three, but two, which is still not one God, but at least two in this verse. Jesus was blemished. Exodus 12 and 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
we go through Leviticus 22, what is qualified Jesus from being a kosher sacrifice. Leviticus 22, 21 through 26. And whosoever offered the sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein, blind or broken or maimed or having a wind or scurvy or scab. You shall not offer these unto the Lord, nor make an offering by fire of them upon the altar unto the Lord. Either a bullock or a lamb that have anything superfluous or lacking in his parts, that thou mayst offer it for a free will offering, but for a vow it shall be not it shall not be accepted. You shall not offer unto the Lord that which is bruised or crushed or broken or cut, neither shall you make any offering thereof in your land, neither from a stranger's hand shall you offer the bread of your God of any of these, because their corruption is in them and blemishes be in them, and they shall not be accepted for you. So Jesus is called the bread of life, right? But who put them on the cross? The Romans. So it says, neither from a stranger's hand shall you offer the bread of your God. You see how this doesn't work? The Christian doctrine does not fit the Tanakh because it completely goes against everything the Tanakh tells you not to do. Or a lamb that have any superfloss or lacking in his parts. So Jesus was circumcised or cut, right? Exodus 4 and 25. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Circumcision, Luke 2 and 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, Jesus was circumcised. So that means his foreskin was cut. It says, bruised or crushed or broken or cut. That is something you cannot offer to God. Mark 15, 17, and they clothed him in purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his, about his head. That's cut. You cannot, you cannot offer these types of things, sacrifice to, to God. So what the Christians will say, well, this is not talking about physical, physical blemishes, it's spiritual. Where are we told that the animals are spiritually perfect? Where are we told that? We don't, we're not told that. So that, that would be something to make an excuse, right? On top of this, Jesus gives false prophecies. Matthew 10, 22 through 23, before you go around the cities of Israel, the Son of Man will come, right? This generation will by no means pass away before all things take place. He never returned. There's some standing here that will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming and his, the kingdom with power. His disciples were not allowed to fast when they were with him for the three years. So that means he got his disciples to sin and not fast. I mean, it just the list goes on and on, right? So the, the spiritual thing doesn't work. The physical thing definitely doesn't work. Bruised, crushed, maimed. Isaiah 53 and 5. We know the Christians love Isaiah 53, but it says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised. Well, I have a whole series on Tanakh Talk going through every verse in Isaiah 53. Go to Tanakh Talk, shout out to William, and go through the series. And you will see Isaiah 53, 5 is dealt with in detail. So if Isaiah 53 was a literal human sacrifice, it will be disqualified for being bruised. Isaiah 53 and 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him. It's another word for maimed or wounded. So um, John 19 and 1, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. That's the wound and be bruised if you get flogged, right? Psalm 89, 29 to 32. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. So Jesus was a son of David. He tells us here he was flogged for breaking the law, which he clearly was flogged, and he did break the law. So he was not wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for his transgressions. If you want to, you know, read everything in context. The perfect Messiah concept is only found in the New Testament. I want to point out David was never told he would have a perfect son. He was told if his sons would sin, they will be punished. Second Samuel 7, 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. This is the son of God referring to Solomon. 
When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with flogging inflicted by human hands. So was Isaac flogged or killed? No. Was Jesus flogged and killed? Yes. Ezekiel 45 and 22. On that day, the prince shall prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering. Who is this prince? And why is he preparing for himself and all the people a bull for a sin offering? If Jesus was the last sacrifice, according to the book of Hebrews, excuse me, and according to some Christian doctrine, there will be no more temple. So who is this prince? Where is this temple at? And why is he offering a bull for a sin offering if the Lamb of God took away the sins of the world? Just a question. Conclusion. Isaac did not complain as Jesus did. Isaac was not sacrificed. Isaac shed no blood. Isaac went on to have a wife and children and was rich. A ram was sacrificed, not a lamb or a man. Passover has nothing to do with forgiveness of sins. Goats are used for the Day of Atonement, not lambs. The words for sheep, lambs, and goats can be specific and general when referring to livestock. How did the Christians make this connection between Isaac and Jesus? They want human sacrifice to be legit to justify Jesus. So they need Isaac to be the example. The problem is Isaac does not fit the description of what happened to Jesus or why he was executed. And with that being said, I hope you learned something from this lesson. And we will see you next time on Yeshiva Perkei Shoshanim on the TV. Thank you and Shalom.